we start our careers out of curiosity. We want to know how the world around works, especially as working in basic science, which is research that is not immediately related to a practical outcome, something like a treatment or a device. But actually, it's very, very exciting when we can provide any use for humanity with our work. And this is the case of a project that I've been working on for the last 10 years here at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, a Dr. Paul Blunt uh, group. And this is a very important project because it, consists, it concerns the antibiotic resistance crisis. And this is a very serious global crisis. It is causing actually 700,000 deaths a year, and it is predicted to kill more than 10 million people a year uh, because of untreatable uh, antibiotic uh, resistant bacteria. And as you know, antibiotics are used to kill bacteria. They will not do any good if you use them for treating the flu or the coronavirus. Um, and the problem is that most and most bacteria are becoming resistant to them. We cannot kill them anymore. And this is a very serious problem, but the way this happens is uh, with the mechanism of natural selection. It's a, something we cannot uh, not have. Uh, this will happen, this is how nature works. And the, the way it happens is that with, when uh, organisms reproduce, they actually make some uh, mistakes or errors in their DNA. So in any given bacterial population, you will have some bacteria that are already antibiotic resistant. Then you treat them with antibiotics, and then the antibiotics uh, will kill the sensitive bacteria, and the bacteria that are not sensitive will grow and produce an antibiotic-resistant population. And the problem with bacteria is aggravated not only because they reproduce very fast, but also they can transfer genetic material to one another. So bacteria that have never seen an antibiotic can acquire antibiotic resistance. And this is a major problem because we use antibiotics not only to treat infections, but we also use them for preventing them when we make uh, surgeries or most modern medical procedures like a heart uh, surgery, transplants, even chemotherapy. So if we lose our antibiotics, we are going to lose uh, the ability to use these uh, life-saving procedures. And this is not something new because, or that we didn't know about, because Alexander Fleming, who actually discovered penicillin, the first uh, used antibiotic, warned, about us, uh, warned us about this, because he knew that he had seen it in his lab, that if he treated at, uh, with low doses of antibiotics uh, some bacteria, some of them will become resistant and not dying anymore. So there is... The process of antibiotic resistance, it's always going to be there because it's the way nature works. But we can make it happen much slower if we use the right doses and also if we use them as little as possible, only when needed. But we are not doing a great job about this because actually 80% of all antibiotics uh, sold are used in animals. We are feeding our livestock, our antibiotics. And the main reason is not to treat sick animals, but also to uh, be able to raise them in very confined and uh, crowded conditions, like in the factory farms. And also something is called uh, growth promotion. If you give very, very low doses of antibiotics to animals, they grow slightly faster. And this is actually the recipe to make antibiotic-resistant bacteria. So there are countries that are legislating this, including the US, but we had to do much better because antibiotics are really life-saving drugs. But we are also, uh, we have a lot of room for improvement in our human use because we are actually over um, prescribing our antibiotics. The CDC um, latest data says that 30% of all antibiotics prescribed have been unnecessary. And it's staggering that in uh, the urgent care facilities, uh, about 46% of antibiotics 
uh, prescribed for respiratory diseases were unnecessary. So we have to take care of antibiotics. But there, there are efforts and, and a stewardship campaign to uh, make uh, better use of them, but this is a global problem, so it's not something that only the United States can solve. And this has to, I encourage you to go to the CDC um, and look at how you can be aware of uh, how to uh, protect these drugs. But then another idea is why don't we make a new drug that, antibiotic, that bacteria never saw and that's it. The problem is it's not that easy. And actually in the last 30 years, the antibiotic approvals have been only declined. And the main reason is that it's not a very attractive product for the pharmaceutical companies because it is very expensive to put a drug on the market and antibiotics are things that you had to prescribe as little as possible. So they haven't been interested in this. But there is one more data that is very interesting that it's since 1987, a, a new drug, a new antibiotic targeting and a new targeting bacteria with an, a, a drug with a new mechanism of action hasn't been released. And this is when basic science comes to the rescue. Because our research, even if it's not focusing on this, sometimes it can bring new tools to solve a crisis. For example, I didn't start my career thinking about developing antibiotics. I actually wanted to be a park ranger. But <laughs> In my country at the time, it was impossible for women to do that, so I settled for biology. And while I was doing biology, I became fascinated by this fact. Every living thing, every creature from bacteria to us are equipped to sense, perceive the world around us and respond to it. And so because of this curiosity, I ended up studying the sensor, how sensory inputs will modulate the outputs, the motor outputs, the movement in leeches. And I studied their neural circuits, and this got me a, a PhD in neurobiology. But then I came here and tried to understand how the mechanosensors, the molecules that can sense and respond to force work. And these are cell proteins, they're channels. And as you might remember, the cell is the um, smallest functional and structural unit of life, and it's defined by a membrane. And it, what goes inside and outside the membrane is exquisitely regulated by channels and transporters. And they will open and allow some ions go in, in and out of the cell, as well as nutrients, right? This particular channel is a me mechanosensitive channel. So it's a channel that is in the cell membrane and opens with force. And mechanosensitive channels are the basis of our senses of uh, hearing, touch, balance, and also play very important roles in cardioregulation, in kidney function, and even in depression. But the particular channel I came to study is a channel from a bacteria. It's called mechanosensitive channel of large conductance. And this channel, we know a lot about it. It was the first cloned channel uh, that had a mechanosensitive function. But the main feature is it has the biggest pore uh, known. And this is how it compares to the pore that opens every other channel. So channels usually are very uh, precise on what goes in and out of, uh, of them. They even can distinguish between different ions, but this pore is huge. And the, the question is, why would you like, if you're a bacteria, to have such a huge pore open, right? And the, the answer is you don't. Actually, this MSCL is a channel that is designed to remain closed and only open in case of an emergency. And as I told you before, everything senses their, their environment, from bacteria to humans. And actually, bacteria are very sensitive of how, things, how much things are diluted or concentrated around them. And this is called osmolarity. So imagine you're a bacteria, it suddenly rains. The things around you become very diluted. The water 
rushes into the cell, makes them swell, and the tension in the membrane is what is going to make MSCL gate. And it gates and immediately releases solutes and reaches a new equilibrium and the bacteria survive. We know this because we can actually remove MSCL. And when we do that with the hyposmotic shock that we call this, the bacteria die. But then there is a, a very important thing that we observed from the beginning. If you mutate this channel and make it gate when it doesn't need to, bacteria really don't like to have this hole on them, and bacteria die or grow very slowly, depending on the mutation you make. So they gave us idea this might be an antibiotic target. If we make an MSCL activator, we can generate a new antibiotic. And there are a couple of things about MSCL that are good for this, because it exists only in microbes. So if you generate a drug targeting MSCL, it's probably going to have a low chance of having side effects. Another thing is it has uh, all of the bacteria, especially all infectious bacteria, have these channels. So if you generate the drug against this channel, probably you can treat many different infections. And a third thing that you might not know, but most antibiotics only kill bacteria if they are growing. If they don't grow, like for example tuberculosis that stays in your body not growing, they are extremely difficult to treat. And this is, they stay in what is called a quiescent state. And because MSCL is present in all stages of bacterial growth, we predict that actually a drug targeted uh, will kill bacteria that are not growing. So the good thing is uh, we, at UTSA Western have access to many resources, and among these, to a library of 200,000 compounds. And what we try to do is to find a molecule that will kill the bacteria only if they have MSCL, an MSCL activator. And the ones that we can produce that didn't have MSCL will not die. So we wanted something specific. Okay, we want to try to validate a target. And actually, we found them. And so we found it for E. coli, which some, uh, some strains are pathogens for humans. And as you can see, we found that they do nothing for the bacteria that, has, that do not have MSCL, but they do kill or slow the growth of the ones that do have it. And this was the same for Staphylococcus aureus, that they produce quite nasty bacterial infections in the skin, as well as a cousin of tuberculosis, that it's a model study. So this is in growing bacteria. But what about quiescent bacteria? In quiescent bacteria, we find the same. Actually, we can kill bacteria that are not growing, which is a really extra bonus for any kind of antibiotic. But lately, and this is very exciting too, we thought, okay, what if also, not only we can make bacteria sick because we open MSCL, but maybe we can facilitate other antibiotics to enter. So we can probably even give lower doses of some antibiotics that are toxic, along with this MSCL activator, and make these antibiotics work better. And we actually found this true for several antibiotics. Here is the data for tetracycline. So if you put the tetracycline alone, bacteria are kind of happy because this is a very low dose. But if, when you combine it with um, the MSCL activator, we find a much, much bigger effect. So we actually could validate an antibiotic target and probably have it also as what we call an adjuvant, something that potentiates the effect of other drugs. So my message here is that if we, as a group that were studying mechanosensors, could find and validate a new antibiotic target, I am hopeful that most researchers around the world trying to figure out how to fight this crisis will prevent us to get to these very, very horrible predictions of 10,000, 10, 10 million people dying. So thank you.